Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the American Numismatic Society very much for having me for this Money Talks. Um, I, as you might have known from my long table that I gave in December, I just started a job here at the University of Michigan, um, and I have quite my hands full, which means that I haven't gotten much of a chance to work on my monograph project um, that is based on my dissertation on the monetary integration, the economic integration and monetary integration of, of late Roman Egypt into the rest of the Roman Empire. Um, so this is very much a work still in progress, and I look forward to hearing comments and, and any suggestions or further avenues of research. And this is the first time I, I'm lucky to, that I get to present on this, um, at least a section of what the monograph, a chapter of the monograph. So originally introduced by Diocletian as part of his numerous monetary reforms, the gold solidus is among the most iconic objects of late antiquity. The coin's weight was reduced and it was more widely minted by Constantine, becoming a symbol of stability of the late Roman and Byzantine empires. But how early did this golden age begin? This talk will present evidence of fourth century solidity in Egypt in order to bring nuance to the role of gold coinage throughout this important century of monetary and economic transition. In March of 298 CE, Diocletian arrived in the province of Egypt. Official imperial visits to the province did not happen frequently and therefore they were commemorated with the minting of gold coinages and other special rituals. This visit, however, was not for celebration. Diocletian entered Egypt with his army in order to reclaim the province and end the revolt of the Domitius Domitianus, an usurper who claimed the purple in Egypt during the summer of 297 CE, but died sometime later that year. After Domitianus' death, his revolt was continued by his corrector, who was a kind of governor's office for some Eastern provinces tasked with the implementation of Roman administration and his name was Aurelius Achilleus. As Achilleus was in charge of the fortifications in Alexandria, Diocletian was unable to reclaim the city and the rest of the province of Egypt until March 298. The exact causes of the revolt are debatable, but they were at least in part due to the economic reforms and taxation policies that Diocletian had recently instituted, one of which directly targeted Egypt's isolated monetary zone and its monetarily separate status among the provinces. Domitianus' revolt represented perhaps the last obstacle in the way of Diocletian's long-term goal of stabilizing, unifying, and streamlining the finances of the empire. That summer, Diocletian traveled up the Nile and visited Oxyrhynchus and Elephantine and procured a peace treaty with the Blemis and Nobatai in exchange for an annual gold subsidy and the establishment of a new border at Philae, which appeased the tribes. He then left Egypt in a much more stable political state than he had come and joined Galerius in Mesopotamia. Diocletian's visit to Egypt is crucial in that it shows the emperor's general strategy for the Roman Empire. Peace in Egypt was important not only to protect its much needed grain supply, but also for other major industries that supplied the empire and its army with goods, such as linen and rope, papyrus and glass. The revolt in Egypt and Diocletian's journey to the province highlighted the central role Egypt played in the stability of the Roman Empire. The inception of a newly reformed coinage replacing Egypt's closed currency system and isolated monetary zone was one of many new political and economic policies instituted during this time. Although the coinage reform of Diocletian was initially established in 294 CE throughout the empire, the production of tetradrams with Greek legends ended only in 296 and the full coinage reform did not take place in Egypt until 297-298 CE, presumably because of the revolt of Domitius. I highlight this story because it shows the price of peace in the late third century, a period marked by wars on nearly all fronts of the Roman Empire, who bled precious metals paying the army and annual tributes in order to keep peace with its problematic neighbors. The role of gold in the Egyptian province during late antiquity has most famously been explored by Jairus Banaji in his seminal book, A Gradient Change in Late Antiquity, Gold, Labor, and Aristocratic Dominance. Banaji's exploration of the gold coinage showed the increasing dependence on late antique society on, on solidity starting in the late fourth century. 
and what it meant for the societal landscape of the Egyptian countryside in which a new class of elites arose with the help of a new source of wealth available. Given the numismatic evidence I will present, it is clear that Banaji's analysis, however, is only really applicable from the 370s and on in Egypt. Accordingly, by using papyrological and numismatic evidence from 4th century Egypt, I hope to bring nuance to our understanding of 4th century monetary economy in the province and to show that in respect to gold, the first half of the 4th century may be perhaps understood as a continuation of the previous centuries of Egyptian monetary history. Thus, in the next few minutes, I will present a brief summary of the history of gold in Greco-Roman Egypt. Gold was always present in ancient Egypt. While there is evidence of its use in pre-dynastic times that is exemplified by this um, child's bracelet, its exploitation and, then into, into, sorry, and the intensification of the industry reached a peak during the Ptolemaic period. In fact, the prominence of gold and bronze in the Ptolemaic currency system set it apart from other Hellenistic kingdoms. Gold staters were part of the earliest currencies of Hellenistic Egypt already in 323 BCE. After a hiatus, of gold in, uh, after a hiatus in gold production, while the Alexandria mint was busy recoining tetragrams, the production of gold coinage was resumed in 294 BCE, this time bearing for the first time the image and legend of Ptolemy as king, like the example below from the Kelsey Museum, or above, sorry, from the Kelsey Museum. In their important 2013 article, Three Gold Coinages of Third Century Ptolemaic Egypt, Julien Olivier and Catherine Lorber present the results of dye studies undertaken on three Ptolemaic gold coinages from Alexandria. This work is particularly important because it provides evidence for the absolute dating of two of the coinages, and more importantly, shows how Ptolemaic gold minting practice was not systematic or constant, but rather a response by the royal authority to a particular historical context. Papyrological evidence makes it clear that the Ptolemies were absorbing metal and reminting it as part of their closed currency system but their need and use of gold bullion was large, which fostered their exploitation of the Eastern desert mines. Well-known literary descriptions of the mines and the vast amount of gold are available, in the, available to the Ptolemies may also be found in the works of uh, Diodorus and Suetonius, among others. Based on current research and excavations in the Eastern desert, Thomas Fauché has potentially identified two particular monetary series that may have substantially benefited from the new gold coming from these mines which allowed the Ptolemies to make heavy gold coinages, such as this fine example of a Meneon of Arsinoe II that is in the Kelsey Museum, weighing a whopping 27.75 grams of gold. Recent quantifications have estimated that the Ptolemies struck between 50 and 100 tons of gold. Only a small quantity of the gold accumulated was, coined for go was used for coin, however, as Fauché asserts. Open quotes, whatever the calculations may be, studies show that the gold used for minting coins constituted only a small part of all of the gold accumulated by the royal treasury, end quote. And indeed, the Ptolemaic closed currency system fostered the absorption of foreign gold coinage for the minting of new Ptolemaic coins, as we saw in the previous papyrus. But gold was minted in order to make payments, and in periods of high state expenses, the need for gold bullion would, of coinage would have been great. Fauché also notes that although exploitation of the gold mines was less significant in the first centuries BCE, according to Suetonius, the Ptolemies were able to accumulate quite a bit of gold. The author describes the amount of gold Octavian exhibited through the streets of Rome after defeating Cleopatra and emptying the coffers of the Ptolemaic kingdom, apparently enough to cause subsequent inflation in Rome. And here I have this quote from Suetonius. Speaking of Augustus, he often showed generosity to all classes one occasion offered, for example, by bringing the royal treasuries to Rome in his Alexandrian triumph, he made ready money so abundant that the rate of interest fell and the value of real estate rose greatly. Now, the Roman period until the reforms of the equation in 297-98 CE, Egyptian currency retained the Greek system of denominations and dating. As the art as the arios was part of the traditional Roman monetary system, it was not part of the Egyptian Greek system of denominations still in place during this time. During the Roman period, however, Eric Christensen has demonstrated the hoarding and active use of RE in Egypt, in Egypt, but it is still contested whether gold coins circulated or not in Egypt freely. 
Luan and Burnett's article is the most recent discussion of monetary integration of Egyptian monetary system prior to the reforms of Diocletian. And they recently concluded that it was only during the time of Nero, between 54 and 68 CE, that there was a potential coordination of the coinage system across the whole empire. During this time, monetary changes were imposed in Rome, Crete, Syria, Cappadocia, and Egypt itself, meant to extract and recover silver from the Roman government. Thus, it seems there was no apparent fiscal need for the state to integrate gold coinage into the Egyptian monetary system. Nonetheless, whether in bullion or coin, gold was still a valuable commodity and already still entered and seemed to have been used in Egypt. During the second and third century CE, we have evidence that Ari were circulating. A prime example of this is Hoard 4 from Karanis, containing 60 Roman Ari, which were found in a courtyard of B11, a second century house in the site, which I think needs a little bit redating this house. Um, the hoard had originally been stored in a cloth bag, whose only remnants were traces of mesh weave left in the soil around it. Um, I think you can see in the upper, um, upper right corner, you can see where the solidity were found, and this is the, the cloth bag that it was assumed that the solidity were found. And here is a picture of, of the hoard and the announcement of its discovery by Francis Kelsey to the president of the University of Michigan. So in something that is really great about the, um, the archives of Michigan is, is that we don't only have the objects that the Kelsey, we also have a lot of archival documentation, including this telegraph here, where you see um, <laughs> in a very short way how Kelsey announces to, to Rackham, which is the graduate school or the, the, the school that they have found the 60 gold solidity. 22 coins were retained by the Department of Antiquities in Cairo, uh, dating to the reigns of Antoninus Pius, Marcus Aurelius, and Marcus Aurelius. And the remaining 38 are kept in the Kelsey Museum and are all dated from the fourth consulship of Antoninus Pius, leading Hadvet and Pedersen to conclude that this is when the hoard was concealed, so namely 156 and 157 CE. In total, Eric Christians had gathered evidence of seven gold hoards containing Roman Ari in Egypt, with coins ranging from the reigns of Hadrian to Gallienus. Although Ari were not part of the Egyptian monetary system, the Alexandrian mint produced few Ari during the Roman period, specifically during the reign of Septimius Severus, to be used outside of Egypt, but not coins to be used, or at least officially, inside of the province. Outside of this instance, instance the mint at Alexandria did not habitually mint gold coins, and when it did, it was only to mark the occasion of the visit of the emperors to the province of Egypt. During the whole history of the Alexandrian mint, besides the reign of Septimius Severus, as I mentioned, small issues of gold coinages were only minted for Vespasian, Maximian, Diocletian, Licinius, Justin II, and Heraclius. Based on the hoard evidence, it is clear that Ari were circulating in Egypt's closed currency system to some extent. And I'll go back here just to highlight um, the number of coins that we have, uh, we have 60, 26. This Abu Kir um, uh, hoard is a little bit problematic as well. Um, and, and Banaji also talks about uh, the, the hoard itself. Then we have 800 Ari also from Hadrian to Commodus that were found. And in these regards, the, the data is a little bit less, sorry, I don't know what's going on with my mouse. Um, the data is a little bit less, less clear. Uh, but you can see that the types of quantities that we have already <laughs> circulating within Egypt. Based on the hoard evidence, it is clear Ari were circulating in Egypt's closed currency system to some extent. One possible hypothesis put forward for this is their importance in commerce, especially in the Roman trade, of which Egypt plays a key role in. Therefore, there could potentially be a system in which the coinage circulated through the province for high transactions and for merchants, Oh, and meant for merchants and their trade, although not officially part of the currency system. Given that there was no equivalent to an aureus in the province, there was a market, so to speak, for the metal bullion the coin contained. Furthermore, substantial aurei have been found in various sites in the Indian subcontinent dating to the second and third century. Starting in 294 CE, Diocletian instituted monetary reforms throughout the empire. Diocletian's currency reform expanded the previous system instituted by Aurelian in the 270s, whose coinage reform had limited durability. The coinage had been heavily debased by the time of Diocletian, since it had been affected by the policies instituted by his predecessors. In conjunction with other reforms, Diocletian abolished Egypt's closed currency system and instituted a new coinage reform throughout all of the provinces. For over 600 years, the Egyptian territory had required currency exchange at its borders for the purchase of goods, 
which allowed very close control of the metal supply and the minting schedule, as well as the extraction of coinage within the province. But this also separated Egypt in some respects from the rest of the empire, giving it a partially isolated economic status relative to the rest of the provinces, a characteristic that strongly challenged Diocletian's political ideal of an integrated empire. After 296, all of the empire, including Egypt, had a gold solidus of 5.45 grams, which was in short order reduced to a weight of 5.3 grams. There was also a silver argentius at 3.4, which soon ceased to be minted, and three denominations of billion coins. For the first time, Egypt utilized the same coinage as the rest of the Mediterranean world. The existence of gold in Egypt, however, seems to have been low, and as I will show later, in a, in a little bit from the compilation of my small database of solidity, they are non-existent in the archeological record before 340 CE. Even though, as I mentioned, even though Egypt was part of the official monetary system, the Alexandrian mint continued minting coins very rarely. The earliest attestations we have of our coins of Diocletian and Maximinus, who are depicted in two series of gold ori issued by the mint of Alexandria during 306 CE. The last Alexandrian gold coinage to be issued during the fourth century was struck for Licinius Queen Canalia in 314 CE. But both of these instances seem to have been small issues and mostly ceremonial in nature. Remarkably for such an important province, no gold coinage was minted at Alexandria between Licinius and the second half of the sixth century. But let's look specifically at what the archeological evidence says. The fourth century gold coins found in Egypt, oh, sorry all day to after 340 CE, and the earliest deposit day for any of the hordes seems to be 347. Therefore, from the hordes themselves, there is no evidence of solidity or RE present in Egypt during the early fourth century. There have been no published single finds of solidity from fourth century Egypt either, to my knowledge. The only gold hoard allegedly to have been found containing Tartarchic solidity was the one listed by Edda in 1905 from Abu Kir which is said to have consisted of ingots and about 600 Ari ranging from Severus Alexander to Constantine, but mainly but coming mainly from the Tetarchic period. However, as noted by Banaji already, there is no numismatic evidence of a sudden rise in production of gold under Constantine. Furthermore, even collections and sales catalogs do not show any indic indication of it either. Open quote, thus in terms of the volume of coinages struck in gold, the contrast between the reign of Constantine and the Tetrarchic period may have been less significant than that between Constantine and the reign of Constantius, end quote. Legal texts mentioning solidity associated with Egyptian merchants only, are only starting in 334 CE. The relocation of the capital from Rome to Constantinople in 330 had also affected the directionality of the grain trade. Although Rome still required substantial grain and strong commercial ties continued via the port of Ostia. An indication of the effect the extraction of tax grain may have had on the grain market of the East comes from the Theodosian Code. This law, dated originally to December 1st, 334, established the rules for the recently instituted transfer of grain to Constantinople from Alexandria. The shippers in charge of the transfer, the Naviculari Orientis, were compensated with 4% of the grain transported, in addition to one solidus per 1,000 mori of grain. As pointed out by the Romanis, this 4% of the grain would undoubtedly have been sold in the private grain market, but its price could have potentially been more competitive than non-subsidized grain, affecting the price of the available grain in the market, but also providing a potential avenue for more revenue for the merchants. In addition, the payment of the single solidus could also explain a, re a reliable mechanism by which solidity entered the Egyptian territory after the 340s. But first, let's take a look at the, the, the database. Um, so this is uh, the compilation I did of the database of bronze and gold coins. And here they are listed by mints. But I have, um, just yesterday, I seriated them specifically by periods of um, of minting. So this database uh, was possible thanks to the work of Hans Christoph Nörke, the German numismatist who published an important catalog of the Eastern Mediterranean in general during the Greco-Roman period. He presents the coinage from Abu Mina as well as the published single finds and hordes from Egypt dating to the period between the fourth and the eighth century C, so really post Diocletian. And then the second basis of this um, compilation is Michael Ford's article Coin hordes of late Roman and early Byzantine Egypt from the reforms of Diocletianus to the reform of Anastasius, 
which was also published in 2000 in the journal Numismatic Chronicle. Um, the article presents several published hordes that are also featured in Noske's volume and eight gold hordes and 16 bronze hordes that do not appear in Noske's volume. So they're meant to be uh, working together or they complement each other in some ways. Um, the article lists the hordes and their bibliographic information with varying descriptions for publication. So that means that we don't have the same information for every single coin, um, which is problematic sometimes when you wanna for provide RIC numbers, for example, to a specific solidity. Nonetheless, between Noske's and Ford's contributions, there are only 424 gold coins dated to the period of the fourth century. Of these, one was minted in 325, and it had a question mark <laughs> in its publication. 17 were minted between 340 and 355. 37 were minted between 347 and 354. Five between 350 and 355. 12 between 351 and 355. Three between 352 and 355, and so on and so forth. And then we see a spike up in the period of 364 uh, to 375, where you have more than half of the coins um, come from this series. Based on the hoard evidence, we can see, so just to remind you, these are all from hoards. There's no single finds of, of solidity that I've been able to trace archeologically in the first half of the fourth century. So based on the hoard evidence, we can see an almost complete absence of gold coinage before the 340s. This could be due to the randomness of archeological finds. However, the papyrological evidence from this period sheds important light into the precious metal supply of authorities in first century Egypt. There is in fact papyrological evidence from Egypt that clearly points to a shortage of silver and gold bullion for state needs during the first quarter of the fourth century. Columbia 7, text 138, 139, and 140, dated to 307 and 308 CE, are receipts for gold and silver bullion from Karanis, which form part of the archive of Aurelius Isidorus. Roger Bagnall edited and analyzed this text and concluded that these exactions did not represent an imposition on landowners who were required to provide gold and silver bullion for purchase by the government at a determined price. The quantity of bullion was calculated based on the amount of taxes paid in wheat by the landowners, quantified in artabas, and it was then purchased by the state with the amounts of gold and silver apparently equal in value. Because the state treated the relative value of these two metals as being a ratio of 12 to one, they required 12 times the quantity of silver as of gold. The requisitions present in this papyri do not exist in a vacuum and have actually been assessed by Jean-Michel Carrier in 1994 and widely accept, ac accepted as part of Diocletian's newly implemented uh, fiscal and coinage reforms. In light of other literary evidence, Carrier proposed that these tetrarchic requisitions, the coemptiones of precious metal in Egypt, are not particular to this province, but part of exactions occurring empire-wide which would be later turned into a regular tax by Constantine. The question of whether or not these requisitions were paid in kind or cash remains open, however, an unknown which has been delineated by Brand's book most recently. While these requisitions of precious metal by the state may not be directly linked to the production of coinage, it is hard to imagine that during this period, the representatives of the Roman state in Egypt and the mint in Alexandria by extension had access to large quantities of silver bullion. Furthermore, the need for this bullion is justified by papyrological evidence from the period detailing the payment of soldiers, a point that Jean-Michel Carrier initially suggested over four decades ago, and which he has recently reiterated in light of new evidence. Using the Panopolis papyri, Jean-Michel Carrier first suggested that the 2,500 denarii donativum mentioned in the text likely implied it 625 denarii gratification for simple soldiers in 300 CE. A figure that Gilles Brandsburg has stated works very well as a multiple of a coin worth 12.5 denarii, 50 coins, rather than in Argente, 12.5 coins. As Brandsburg points out further in his analysis, this does not mean that silver coins were not incorporated into the pay, but it proves the need for a base coinage to complete these payments. Furthermore, the use of the terms balantion and attike represents a reasonable proof that billion and silver coins were both used to settle the monetary components of military pay. Whether a stipendium, salary, a donativa, gratifications, or alimenta, supplies, it is clear that base coinage was used to some extent to settle the payments during this period. 
The state's limited access to supplies of precious metal and a strong need for base coinage could partially explain the need for alternative minting in the province. The fact that a large quantity of coin molds, such as these 15,000 from Dionysius, are dated to the same period where there is both a scarcity of officially minted coins, evidence for forced requisitions of precious metals, and evidence for the payment of soldiers using base coinage clearly demonstrate that these phenomena are related. The mint at Alexandria could have been closed for a period of time due to this lack of silver bullion, or the Ophikine were reduced, creating an immense need for small value currency. The contemporaneous lack of high denomination currency could have fostered the use of small change for late monetary transaction, large monetary transaction, sorry, such as payments of the troops, which would mean that given the difference in value, more and more billion or bronze coinage was needed for purchases, putting stress on a mint whose political situation has been tenuous for the preceding decades. And here, um, I just wanted to show that this, this, these coin molds were already noticed by Alessandra Gara in the 1970s um, as part of this quasi-official um, supply of coinage in Egypt uh, for the army. And it's only it recently in line, in line with the more numismatic and papillological evidence that this um, hypothesis has been um, uh, proven. During the reign of Constantius II, uh, yeah, sorry, during the reign of Constantius in the middle of the fourth century, however, a change can be seen in the usage of gold currency. Its usage in large transactions is much better attested than in previous periods, and the number of solidity available in the numismatic records rise. During this time, the fiduciarity of the bronze coinage goes down, meaning that after the 350s, bronze coinage had more intrinsic value compared to its officially tariff value in the early fourth century. Roger Bagnall and Gilles Bransburg analyzed from both a papyrological and a numismatic perspective the effect of the monetary reform issued by Constantius between 351 and 353. The outlines of price movements and debasement were already set out by Bagnall in his 1985 book, Currency and Inflation in Fourth Century Egypt. But this new study adds price information that has become that's come to light more recently and incorporates a full numismatic analysis of the bronze and the gold currency. Uh, so just to summarize uh, the work that uh, Roger Bagnell published in this article, uh, along with Gilles Brand's work, basically from the fourth um, from century, we have basically only five texts mentioning solidity, uh, and none of them are actually being used for a transaction, as you can see here, they're used uh, mostly as a unit of account. And this is, means that there's the equivalent of only one attestation for every 75 published documents. Um, for those of you that work with papyri, we know that the fourth century actually has quite a bit of text, so it's not a, an absent uh, century from the papyrological record, so I think it says a lot that, that, this, that there's no receipts of payment with solidity. When you compare it, though, in the 350s, um, the picture changes quite rapidly and, 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 and dramatically, I would say. Um, Basically, we have nomismatia or, or solidity mentioned in 38 texts, which is the equivalent of one for every almost three papyri, much higher rate than before the 350s. And we have the first actual test, uh, text that we have where the solidus is being used as a unit of payment. It comes from 352, um, so well into the middle of the fourth century. In the article, Bag Roger Bagnall also shows a price discontinuity in Egypt between prices before 350s and those after 353. And Jill Bransberg identifies a hoard discontinuity around 348 and 354. This monetary revolution is evident in the quantity of hoards deposited after the 350s, compared with the first half of the fourth century. And it's also evident in the absence of any solid dating before the 340s, found either in hoards or as single finds. Therefore, it is imperative to recognize that much of the coinage in circulation prior to Constantius was of lower quality and subsequently recalled. What is crucial here is that trust in the fiduciarity of the coinage had mostly disappeared, just as it had in the latter part of the third century. After Constantius, coins were more consistently valued by the intrinsic value of the metal in them, in line with the evolution of behavior from the later third century and on and thus the better quality bronze coinages remain in circulation until the late fifth century, where a pure bronze piece was introduced. 
but fiduciary remained common phenomenon in small denomination coinages throughout the later Roman Empire. And before I close, I wanted to go back to the database just to point out that of these coins, this, so they, I organized these coins by the years when they were minted because I'm more interested in how the, the supply, let's say, at this time. These coinages, however, stay in circulation well into the sixth century. So for example, we have um, early sixth century hoards that contain a lot of coins or solidity from Valens and Valentinian. Um, we also have uh, quite a bit of uh, circulation uh, of post Anastasius bronze um, that is, is circulating in tandem with, with uh, the other bronze coinage. So it, it means that we have a, a better monetary system instituted after the 350s that is of good intrinsic quality of value, which is what we usually associate with the solidus. But this only started way after during Valentinian and the reign of balance. <clears throat> um, given the requisition from landowners of precious metal bullion, the evidence of payment of soldiers using base currency, as, as John Michel Curry has shown, the lack of evidence of solidity actually being used for payment in as transaction, as Roger Bagnell has shown, uh, the absence of gold coinage dating to the first four decades of the fourth century in the archaeological record, and the idiosyncratic history of gold coinages in Roman Egypt prior to the reform of Diocletian makes it clear that at least in, Egypt, in the Egyptian province, the first half of the fourth century cannot be considered part of Banaji's model of function of gold in late antiquity. And in some ways, we are still very much in the third century CE. Thank you for your time. Okay. Um, I think I finished a bit early, but yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I welcome any comments. As I said, this is very much a work in progress and I'm still trying to reconcile um, a lot of evidence as you can see ranging from coin, coin hordes, coin molds, papyri. But yeah, thank you. I'm Gamal Amer. <clears throat> I have a, a, a question. Uh, in, in, in a slide where you have a, 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 a large uh, spike in coins, what do we attribute uh, that spike to? I mean, uh, the level, is it just because we found more hordes uh, for, from that period, or is it an indication of, of uh, uh, increased use just in that period, 64 to 75, uh, so, uh, while the rest is not, uh, before and after did not compare? There, there seems to be a new source of gold that the Sil Morrison um, has published on in the, starting the 350s in the Balkans. So this aids the production of solidity. And there are also um, much more wars being fought in the Eastern front of the empire, which is why if you look at the, oh, if you look at the composition, so look at the right number of gold coins, you look by mint, Antioch has 252. Mm. But most of the coins coincidentally, it's not a coincidence that 253 is the same number. Almost all of these coins from, from, come from the mint of Antioch. Okay. which is the main mint in the East uh, because it's supplying all of these high army and ex state expenses in the wars in the East. Um, that is my understanding of the situation so far uh, of this spike. So it's, the spike is because of a war in the, in the, in the Eastern province or uh, because I mean, Antioch was, was productive that specific period of time? Antioch is the most productive uh, mint of solidity in late antiquity, I think it has, and along with Constantinople. Um, but during the late fourth century, I believe, and this is something that I want to research more, it has to do with the war front and like, you know, supplying this, this route towards the Eastern front. Um, I mean, you're minting gold, right? Because you have to pay expenses. So this is the nearest mint. Um, Constantinople would have been a little bit too North, I think. Um, to be to have a direct supply of, of gold um, for the for the what's going on in the east in the wars. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, I have a question now on on the you know base coinage. I mean, you you you've been showing in your presentations that um, uh, during the first half of the fourth century, because of the scarcity of gold. Uh, base coins must have been playing a, a role, but outside of Egypt, um, there are quite 
few mixed hordes of, uh, let's say, late Antoniniani, or so late third century coins mixed with uh, coins of a, with a tetrarchic reform, um, you know, because basically there was no change with the uh, currency unit. Mm -hmm. But it's a different case. Um, the Egypt left drachma system to, to enter the, the new system of a dinner, well, the, uh, yeah. uh, to get integrated. So do we have um, evidence that the older drachma uh, were removed from circulation actively um, around you know, the 294, 301 period, so the, uh, the Diocletianic period? Yeah, um, this is something I, I've, I've wondered myself because the mint seems to have been producing both for a little while, both types, new and old types of coinages at the same time. Um, something that I, I mean now the database is not 30,000 now my database is 42,000 coins so one of the things I want to do is seriate them by hoard and see you do see them sometimes circulating together that the earlier tetradrams um, with the new the new bill and coinage um, it does happen uh, the extent to which it does I don't have numbers for you but it does it does happen um, especially because the mint itself was seems to have been producing both types of coinages, Latin and Greek coinages at the same time for a few years. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a question as, as also for the supply as, as we are working on, you know, there's just a low supply of any precious metal. So you, you take what you have and what you can. Um, we also have a question in the chat. Do you have any thoughts about the fifth century? The fifth. Oof, not yet, <laughs> um, but it seems to it, it seems to be much more stable and well integrated. I think economically. So one of the things I did for my dissertation was not only look at the monetary integration, but also look at um, the trade of, of wine and other commodities that you can see in other uh, provinces. And in in this regard, the fifth century is really where you start seeing, at least on the archaeological record and the numismatic, a Byzantine Egypt that is very very much part of the rest of the Roman Empire. Um, I think before the 350s, or before the 370s, you still see uh, the, the separation, let's say, from the, uh, from the trade networks. However, something to note, and these are, these are all the gold coinages that you see here, I mean, sorry, the bronze coinages, is that Alexandria mint, if you compare it to other mints, is quite lazy <laughs> in that regard. It's not very active. I mean, most of the bronze supply is being issued already in the fourth century by outside mints. So you see Antioch is supplying quite a bit of coinage. The propontic mints are, oh, sorry, I thought I was sharing. Sorry, I thought I was sharing my screen, I wasn't. Um, the propontic mints are supplying the same quantity of coins that Alexandria is supplying to Egypt already in the fourth century. Uh, so I think it's just that we, had, we just have a much more stable gold currency in the fifth century. And this is where Banaji's model of a new elite um, that may be um, that it rises because there's more quantity of gold uh, could potentially work. Uh, I'm not saying it does work. I think there are some issues to be said of the economic model that Banaji exposed. But I think the fifth century is a, is a different, we're in a different monetary zone. Yeah, sorry, I turned the screen share off just for the discussion. <laughs> no, no worries. I was like pointing, I was like, oh, wait, like, no one can see this. Um, but I guess this next question in the chat uh, is about one of your graphs. Is the graph of coins by date perhaps a graph of coins by ruler? The dates overlap, he says. I'm not, I'm not even sure which one he's referring to. So the, yeah, the, the series of coins, those are by RIC typology. So I didn't put the RIC type numbers because I wanted to keep the graph simple, but all of the solidity have an RIC number. So I just took the, the, the range of years that RIC gives the, um, the solidus. Um, but yeah, I, but I, I wanted to ask a question to some, one, some, some <laughs> audience members, Go for it. Uh, particularly Toma, because something I, I do wonder is, I mean, we have already circulating in Egypt in high quantities, it seems. I do want to know what happens to gold during the Ptolemaic period, because we do have this spike, it seems, uh, you know, in the, in the third century and then what happens in the second and first, I think that's like the other areas that I wanna understand because I mean, when you understand that the function of gold coinages in general on the long durée history of Egypt, the 350 CE of course starts in, in contrast, but I wanna understand also what happens in the inception in the beginning of the, 
uh, of the of the monetary series. So that's something that that's a bit a bit of a gap that I don't understand why there's just less gold all of a sudden in the first century BCE. Um, I don't know if he's there <laughs> or anyone. If anyone has any idea, but yeah, that's one of the directions I want to understand. Um, um, yeah, if I can, it's Thomas. Um, I, I just wanted to, um, yeah, well, we, we don't really know what the, 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 the gold coins are disappearing in the middle of the second century. It may have to do with the, um, with the gold mining as well, uh, because it looks like the evidence of gold mining is disappearing at the, the end of the second century, but we didn't excavate uh, enough to, to know if it's a real end for the gold mining, but uh, apparently it does, doesn't really start until yeah, like the late Roman period. Uh, so it's difficult to, if it's related or not. Um, yeah, I, I was wondering myself how, uh, to what extent the gold minings were providing gold to the to the mine to, to the mint of Alexandria, and uh, for the moment we don't know because we don't have the uh, we don't have the volumes. Uh, and when they struck, I mean, gold coins in Alexandria, it's in really large volumes. Uh, did the gold mines in the Eastern Desert provide for this gold? It's it's not sure. So we we are still wondering. Yeah, Thomas, um, Thomas Irene, yeah. I'm asking this question about the late Ptolemaic period. I know it's not the focus of this uh, monitor, but uh, I've been for some time. Um, at the very end of the Ptolemaic period, we have a lot of evidence about the Ptole Ptolemaic state being bankrupt and borrowing money from the Romans and so on. Uh, nevertheless, as uh, Irene reminded us, when uh, Octavian uh, sized Egypt, it looks like he was able to grab a very substantial uh, amount of, of, uh, of wealth. So what, and at the same time, gold coins are no longer minted in the first century BCE. So what, what can we say about that situation in, in, the later, in the later period of the Ptolemaic kingdom? No, I, I think that the, the fight, the, I mean, the fact that the, the Ptolemaic state is bankrupt is some kind of a topos. I, I don't believe anything in, in, in this because I think the Ptolemaic state is still wealthy. Uh, we have evidence for the, the amount of, um, of grain and the, the annual revenue for Ptolemy the 12th, and it's like 10,000 talents a year. So it, it's still enormous. Uh, of course, we have the dynastic problems and, and the fight between brothers and sisters and, and that, that are happening. But I think the, the Egyptian state is really wealthy, even in the first century, uh, in even its century BC. So I, I don't think it's, uh, uh, it's it caused the, the fact that they don't struck gold anymore. It must be another reason. And for the moment, I, I don't really see why they, they did stop this, uh, this mint. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think I, I was, I'm thinking, trying to think more of, I mean, when I think of the early fourth century, because it has so many characteristics of the third century monetarily, I think it has to do more with just the nature of gold coinage in Egypt, uh, rather than, than any kind of Roman, let's say, imposed impose system. Um, but as you can see, the, there were quite a bit of ori, and I'm certain a lot of quantity of ori must have just gone through the province for it, like in this Indo-Roman trade, if you think also just paying subsidies, um, traveling south, merchants uh, are going through the province. So I'm certain like gold flowed through the province um, very easily. Um. I, um, I had a question, Irene, um, about the, the, the small lead coins that, uh, that we found pretty much everywhere in, the, in that period. Uh, you mentioned that the fact that they can use in a military um, uh, in a military um, sense, um, it's very interesting. But why we would make molten coins and like, like official coins from the from the mint? Do we need something from the countryside or something like this? I'm sorry. Can you phrase your question? Why would we need mold coins? Why do we need them? No, yeah. Yeah, more than coins instead of uh, regular truck coins from the regular mint of Alexandria. I think uh, they just there's just no precious metal in Egypt. 
Um, I think that's what the papyri shows. And also Gilles, Roger and I are working on some other evidence that Roger discovered that is not only silver and, and gold that is lacking, it's also copper. Um, so it's just like a complete lack of precious metal. Um, I don't know what is going on with the Alexandra Mint. I think that's one of the things I wanna try to understand in a narrative because even if after the early tetrarchic, once we look at let's say post 350s, it's not that we have a boom of Alexandria mint all of a sudden active. Still, most of the mints supplying the Egyptian province with coinage are outside. And if you look at, uh, at Alexandrian coinage outside of Egypt, it's quite almost non-existent. So it seems like just the, the mint is not very active at all um, in comparison to other imperial mints. So I, it's, it's, I think it's something that could be peculiar to the, uh, the mint of Alexandria. Um, and then the reason for these coin molds, I don't know, I think it's, it has to do maybe with the army is the first, the most desperate for them, the most, the ones that need them the most as John michel Carrier showed also in the, in the Panopolis papyri that these payments are being made with uh, units in, in bronze, most likely. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah, 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 uh, it's, it's good, it's good. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, go ahead. One, one thing that is striking is that you don't get as much of the bronze currency from mints outside Egypt coming into Egypt in the first part of the century as you do later. So mm -hmm. it's it's not just the failure of the Alexandrian mint to produce this coinage. It's not getting sucked into Egypt either. Yes, and, 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 and yeah, go ahead. And, and is there, I mean, Roger, do you, find any reason for that and why there, there was no supply that specific period? No, I have no idea at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. it's very, very curious. I, I don't know whether there's some kind of economic dislocation that temporarily makes uh, Egypt less successful in bringing money in. Uh, if it's just, um, you know, if, if the balance of trade has gone in the wrong direction for a while and so the money isn't flowing in, I really don't know. But it, it does seem that the shortage is complete. It's not just local production. But one of the, the explanations could be that, I mean, the, the Egypt was functioning as a closed monetary system for like six centuries. Yeah. And it must have been quite a, quite a shock and quite a difference to try to make the economy normal again, like the, the monetary system normal again. Maybe it's, uh, it's, it's the pace of, uh, yeah, like changing the habits and and things like this, and and bringing some some metal inside. Maybe it's one of one of the reasons. I, I don't know more than this. Yeah, no, that's that's quite possible. I, mean, I think the shock of integration must have been considerable. Yeah, I, I mean that, that that is that's how I wonder how to think about this ori though, because if we believe the ori that um, Christensen is showing. There is, there is a mechanism in which this boundary is quite fluid, you know, because there's no gold coins. So of course we're gonna take whatever gold coins we can that are circulating. Um, but at the same time, then you have this period of low production of the Alexandra mint, but then you have immediately, it's not like it ever produces that many coins though. It's not like you see the uh, mint all of a sudden active in the 340s or 350s. Like it, it stays at this very low 18% of all the coins, bronze coins found in the, minted in the fourth century found archeologically, only 18% are made by the Alexandrian mint. Now, when you compare this to other provinces around the empire, the local mint is usually supplying 40 or 50% at least of the coinage in the, in the, in the nearby provinces. So look at Macedonia, the mint in Thessalonica is providing something like, I think 60% of the coinage. So you see a more localized. It's only Egypt that stands this very cosmopolitan composition of um, of, of mints, uh, but, but I think it has to do exactly as you say that Alexander is just not, is not active. So it's absorbing, it's acting like a magnet absorbing as much coinage as it can, um, when it can. Well, do you have any other questions? We're at the hour mark pretty much. Oh, my clock is off. We theoretically have some more time if you do have some more questions. No? Okay, well, thank you. I hope everyone enjoyed. We had a great turnout today. So I mean, thank you again.
Um, next week, we're going to have Jesse Kraft talking about American colonial paper money. Uh, not next week, excuse me, next month, our money talks will be. So I hope everyone enjoyed. Have a good Saturday. Thanks, thanks for coming. Oh, we're getting a round of applause from everyone with their camera on. I would be too. <laughs> I could turn mine off. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.